And a lot of people have husbands who are incapacitated in some way, maybe health issues, maybe mental health issues, maybe they're, you know, got dysfunctional patterns and so forth. How do we deal with those? So we have a very, very wonderful lady on the Get Real with Leia show today who has actually both those issues. And she's, um, I had a chance to visit with her, and she's very, very forthcoming in her feelings. She's very clear on her own shortcomings and what she'd like to grow. And um, I'm very happy today to welcome Debbie. Debbie has been married for 19 years. She's got four kids, ages 14, 11, 6, and 2. And um, uh, her husband has had ba brain tumors off and on for about 10 years. And, you know, Hashem has saved his life. God has saved his life many, many times during that course. She's been through a lot. She's a real trooper, and she's here to share with us both her triumphs and the tribulations and the emotional issues that underlie this very, very challenging issue. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you so, so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay, I, we, I, we have to turn her volume up because I could hardly hear her. So just for those of you who don't know about the Get Real Leia, it's basically Debbie's here completely anonymous because she, uh, we have a synthesizer that like chipmunks her voice or whatever. So she sounds like she's the witness protection agent. Uh, what is it? Rich and program. program. The, rich, <laughs> which, w the witness, say that three times fast. Yes. The witness protection program. And, but at least you don't know who she is and she can totally be honest with her feelings without talking gossip, Lashamhara about her husband. So, uh, and also it keeps her anonymous, but gives us the great gift of being able to see inside what it's like and what people are really going through and how we can learn from that and God willing grow from that. So Debbie, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about what issue um, you'd like to accomplish today? Uh, so I would like to discuss and learn how I can maintain a normal, healthy, loving, emotional connection with my husband when he has two things going on. Number one, he has depression that he refuses to admit, and that makes him... Depression. Not... Yeah. Yeah, depression. Sure heard depression, okay. And also when he has his, he has these times where he's very, very negative and his tone and his words are hurtful. And uh, I try not to let it bother me, but I'm a lady, so. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. And uh, how not to be judgmental of him that, you know, Hashem has saved his life. He really could do anything that he wanted to say thank you or even like, you know, thank God money is not an issue for us. He could ask himself, what is my bucket list of things I would like to accomplish in this life? Hashem has so graciously given me back so many times and then go out and do it. That's that would be the antidote to his depression. I myself have experienced postpartum depression and even prepartum depression, prenatal. But, but, and so I'm not unfamiliar with it. But I also know that I just have to push myself that one first little bit and like get myself over that initial hump, right? All beginnings are hard. And then I'm so much happier from being busy and productive mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how to. I, and before all of this medical thing happened, and even during, just like we were, we. I love him to pieces. He's amazing. He's a fabulous man, and we are soulmates. And it's really great. Uh, Hashem would not give me this test unless I could handle it, right? Like He wouldn't give me a smaller thing because then I wouldn't take it seriously. <laughs> I need to know how to do it. So, yeah, yeah I hear a, so a couple of questions just to clarify. You know, you say that the negativity, um, uh, he, he gets into bouts of negativity. Two questions. One are, is bouts meaning every day, every time you see him, or is it, you know, uh, once a month? You know, what does that look like? And then the second question is, was he like that? Did he have that negativity before all of the medical issues started? 
Okay, so it's a little hard to answer you about what is the interval of his negativity. Um, actually, right now, he's pretty okay, but that's just been the past that's good. little while. Um, my, my parents are about to come, and I'm a little bit concerned that that's going to turn the tide for us the other way. But um, it's really unpredictable. He's on this you know, anti-seizure medication that causes him to have less patience. Um, and as for the second question, uh, he, he always did lack patience, but for certain things, but for me, he had lots of, lots of patience. But so, not anymore, um, you think? But not anymore. It's hard, but his limit is only in the so-called normal, regular mm -hmm. people. So he's short with you, like, you know, how come dinner's not ready at five o'clock or whatever? Like, what do you give? Me, can you can no, give us an example? I, can, I try to leave him alone as much as possible in terms of having our family and the house and everything. Mm -hmm. But if I don't know something, I need to ask him, and so. If I ask too many of those questions at once, that will hurt. I see. You mean about should I do the, about running the household or what he want, what he prefers, or things that you're burdening him with, or you're trying to be nice to him and do a nice thing for him? No, like I don't know where the, we just moved, so I don't know where a lot of things go. Is and I'm also trying to get rid of things, so. Do I need this? Is this yours? What is this? Can we get rid of it? Where does it go? I get it. And so then he's short with you. Well, moving's yeah. pretty stressful in any circumstance. I would imagine in your situation, it's like ten, yeah. like hello, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. both. So wow. it's, the truth is that it's both. It's both stressful and the positive because it gave him something to focus on. He he was needed. Like he was needed to get this move going and make it happen. And so whenever we're, we're still like getting settled in. And so when he feels that like he is being needed, then he's happier. You mean needed, you, 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 he needed to help make decisions? The very thing you said that needed was giving him stress? To settle, to, to set up, to set up furniture, to move things. I see. Uh, yeah. I see. Okay, so let's let's get some some um, th for, for everybody who's listening who has an issue where you feel almost like a victim to the, your husband's emotional state. Basically, it's like is he up? Is he down? What's going on with him? He's got health issues. You know, it, it's it's uh, it, it's terrifying. But at the same to t token, your everyday existence can't be you know feel like the you know like there's a um, a yo yo. And you're like the bottom of yo-yo, and what you know what I'm saying? Like you're you're pulled up, you're pulled down. You, you have no control and no power over your own life. It's very very scary and frustrating, and and uh, difficult. So now also depending on my own emotional state and strength, I'm able to do the you know thank you that he's alive, and I know where it's coming from. It's not his fault. He has less. Uh, the of in this issue, but then when I'm not, then I'm just swept along. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay, so you have you you're human. You have like your strengths and your weaknesses, yeah. and it, it waxes and wanes like the rest of us. Okay, yeah. so fine. So how do you? How can we view this? So here's one thing. I actually want to read something that. Um, because this is, it, it's it's so weird how things come in sets of threes or whatever. Like, you're the third person that has had a situation where it's kind of like a victim. And in fact, you know, I was talking to Sarit, I was thinking I should do something like, you know, how to break out of the victim syndrome, you know, a whole class on it, because it, it's so powerful. So I just want to tell you. So a few months ago, uh, maybe about six or seven months ago, I was a w woman who felt she was a total victim to her husband's behavior. So 
she, you know, she was saying he did this and he did that and he did this and he did that. And I said to her, you know, with as much love in my heart as I possibly could muster, I said, you know, I could sit here for an hour or two hours or three hours and validate for you all of your, the fact that all of your husband's behaviors are wrong, that he's bad, that he doesn't care enough as he should, he doesn't show actions as much as he could. I could sit here the whole time and validate your feelings about what your husband is doing wrong. And guess what? At the end of that, you'd have zero power. Zero. Right. You just, you know, you. it's like, okay, you're, you know, you're, it's kind of like you're, <laughs> suddenly the, the bright future is gone and a black curtain comes down because you just are stuck there with way, the way it is. So I said to her, what might be powerful is if you can think of point zero 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 five percent that's your fault like in other words you know what are you doing when he says the mean thing to you you say a mean thing back well if you didn't say a mean thing back and just walked away would that help oh you do that you know okay would it be if you complimented when you walked in the room whatever to try and pick apart the point tiny tiniest tiniest grain of what your fault is what you could do better to alter the situation so she got very very upset with me she got very upset very insulted and affronted and like you know basically offended that I would try and have her see this and I said okay I, I totally get that and I told this to a woman actually this week as well and she she also I think was was quite not she said you know Leah you're barking up the wrong tree but anyway this lady from six months ago I said this to her and I said if you can walk out this door and anytime something happens in your relationship that doesn't work and that you're just <clears throat> and you're making your husband wrong and you're blaming your husband and you're feeling like a victim, if you could freeze and say to yourself, what can I do in this current situation? What, what can I do to make it better? What, what responsibility can I take for anything? You know what? Instead of barging in and saying we have to leave in 10 minutes, I probably should have texted him an hour ago. Yeah, his reaction was disgusting and how he treated me was horrible and what he said to me was horrible. But there is that 0.0005% thing I could have done. If you go there, guess what? You suddenly have huge power in your hands and instead of feeling like a victim you feel like something I can do and as you look in more of more of those things and as you do more and more and hopefully as the situation improves just a tiny tiny bit the, a, a swelling of power in your it, it, it overcomes you and you lose the victim whole thing so here's the thing that happened with this it's kind of like doing that looks at, you know, maybe you're trying in some way to make your husband treat you badly. I know that's horrible, v victims, and this is, I'm not an expert in abuse, so please, if you have really serious abuse, and if you're questioning whether it's serious abuse or not, it probably is serious abuse, go talk to somebody who's an expert in it. But for the people who, you know, okay, it's not really serious abuse, it was, that was a nasty thing he said to me. That was a, he did something. He he you know uh, slammed something down, or he you know maybe that's a little violence. I don't know. Ask ask a professional. But when you ask you something, looking at that and saying what am I doing to make things worse, is the eye of the needle for you to f have power. So I did go speak with this lady not too long ago. I would say a few, a few months after she had done it. And she, well, here's what she said to me. She said that tiny ownership of going from feeling powerless to powerful is that um, she's began to see things in her marriage that she never saw before, the dysfunctional patterns in her marriage. And she said that it was very eye-opening to her and that hopefully over time they're going to break some of their deep-rooted, dysfunctional, unhealthy patterns. So I'm not, I know you've had a beautiful relationship and I'm not hoisting all this stuff onto you, but I just wanted to couch our whole conversation here by your understanding that 
there is a part of us that, you know, when something happens, like you get terrified for a minute, you know, I knew this was going to happen. I, you know, oh, you know, whatever. There is that part of us that's sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And if anybody's come from a dysfunctional relationship with their parents or a, a household or past relationships, it's kind of like you play that familiarity is a lot more um, easy to slip into than healthy and good. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, it's, it's really important to start to look at any interaction when he is treating you poorly or whatever, what can you do differently? So you needed his advice. You need to walk into his room and say, okay, what do you want me to do with this? So did you want this upstairs? Did you want this over here? Did you want that? You know, wherever it is, you need to ask him things. It could be, you need to brainstorm a little and say, you know what? He gets really agitated when I give him eight things, but I, I, I'm giving him the eight minimum amount of questions I have. I've got 25 of where does that go, this go, that. I'm putting them all over here, but the big things, I need to know where they go. You know what? Right. What if I were to make a list, you know, to just take, type up a list on the computer and then at the, put a blank line under each thing and say, your uh, old camera that you never use anymore, where would you like that? And checkbox, upstairs, downstairs, in the trash, donate to, give it to my brother who would be into it, or give it to let the kids play with it and unscrew the, screw it and take the camera apart and see what it looks like inside. I don't know, I'm making this up, but I'm just saying, you know, and then you, you have like 10 things there and bring it to him and say, is this, is this going to annoy you more or is this an easier way to do it? You know, or, at, or maybe even before you do it and waste an hour of your time or half an hour of your time, say, you know, I thought of maybe instead of coming in here and bugging you and annoying you, I would just leave a list and, if, you know, I'll give it to you. And as long as it's back within a couple of hours, it's taking a creativity of what can you do that gives you power that doesn't make you afraid because there is nothing worse than walking into a room and not knowing if you're going to get your head butt, bit off, not knowing what mm -hmm. the per, what's what's going to be today. So, um right. Yeah. So is that something is, is making a list something that could solve that problem for you? Uh, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I can say that I could pay attention to our lives to see if that is happening. So there, there's two issues here, Debbie, that, that we want to focus on. One is emotional. What's going on with you emotionally inside? And the other one is logistics. What you can do mm -hmm. logistically to help solve your problems. And working with them both in tandem, you can see like from one day to the next, you're walking through your life, your gloomy, whatever, what's going to be in the future. Where is my, where'd my husband go? You know, where's this guy who I loved and he's my soulmate and whatever, where is he? You know? And, and, you know, there's a way to, you know, cause you would ask me on the phone, how do you connect when, you know, cause I asked, and, and maybe I'll share it with, with you know, I said, well, wh what happens on date night? And your answer about date night was, are you still there? I hear weird voices in the background. Yes, I Okay, hear good. You. Fantastic. Okay, good. So um, maybe I'm hearing them in my head. I don't know. Okay, we good? Huh? Okay, yeah. fine. Okay. Um, if somebody on the teleconference wants to ask a question or something, you can press star six and we'll hear your questions. And also, um, people on Facebook and Instagram, if you have comments or questions, go ahead and send them in and Sarit will read them to me and we will, you can be part of the show. We'd love to hear if you have questions or comments about this. Okay. So, uh, when I asked you about dead date night, you said you can't look up to him because you don't you know, you just want to, if you went on a date night with him, you just want to ask him, why don't you do something productive with your life? That was the question you said. Where is he as a person? Why, um, uh, why, why can't, you know, the, the whole upset resentment and anger that you have of why he's wasting his life, uh, why he's doing nothing, why, where does get up and go, go. Um, that is a trauma you know, you might even be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder about that because... I've thought that many times. Yeah, yeah. And that's something, you know, you yourself can go talk to somebody or get a book or, uh, you know, maybe there's even videos on how to deal with these kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. But, but you know, 
take care of your own emotional needs. It's, it's crucial. It's crucial here. You, you know, so let's, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to leave the emotions for a second, start doing logistical. Cause I think there's a lot that can be handled here logistically. And I wrote them all down so that I wouldn't forget them because they're powerful. Okay. Yeah, Rosemary <clears throat> actually on Instagram shared that she recalls a time when fear took control of her. So it seems that fear is and emotions are a big factor that can actually <coughs> implode and cause the whole relationship to yeah, because you, it's one thing to miss your husband, it's another thing to miss yourself. Like, where am I? And there's a, you know, it's like there's a terror that can go on of, of not feeling like yourself and not feeling normal and moving. By the way, you know, even though it was a good thing and got him busy, it's also an emotional upheaval. Um, and uh, so, <coughs> but let's just figure out a couple of questions for you. So let's let's look at logistics and see what can be done logistically. So okay, the only Rega, Rega, I'm sorry, but just the only thing I could think that I'm doing, I don't know if you call it right, I don't know if you call it wrong, but it is what this, uh, you know, writer in just said, which is about the fear, is that I am, I put on this happy face and I'm very patient, but I am tiptoeing. You are so, oh tiptoeing, so, tiptoeing I'm around tip-toeing. your house or, or ta- at least let's take. Cautious. I'm cautious around him. Like, around him. Mm, which face is going to come out? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so the only other thing I could think of is to turn that on its head, which is to be, uh, I don't know what the word is, strong, uh, unafraid. But then I don't know how to do that in a way that doesn't trigger. <laughs> trigger so, what? Trigger the impatience. Uh, oh, his impatience. His impatience. <laughs> I got it. Um, okay, so let, let that's back to emotions. I want to cover logistics just for a oh, second. Sorry. and then, Okay, that's good. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. Okay, so first of all, there's diagnostics going on here that would be really, really good for you to know. Maybe you know them, but have you talked to his neurologist or his um, uh, neurosurgeon about whether the medications are affecting him apathetically, whether he's have has has post traumatic stress disorder, whether he has possible brain damage from the things. Have you have you gone to the neurosurgeon and asked those questions? I didn't ask about we went, yeah, I went the third appointment ago uh-huh. and I just broke down crying in front of her saying, Could you please, you know, he needs uh, he needs antidepressants. And so she said that um, here's a here's a doctor right here across the hall. She's very empathetic. She's very understanding. And I went to the desk to try to get an appointment. And my husband left me, and he went down to the parking lot. And I was afraid he was going to leave me there and drive home without me because uh, I wouldn't put it past him in some of his more extreme states. And I would have I don't know how I would have gotten home, but thank God he did not. And so he just doesn't admit to having any issue. Now, as for what the neurologist said... Wait, time out. Can I just doesn't... time out? Before you tell me about the neurologist, you yeah. broke down and cried in front of your husband with her? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, so, yeah. <clears throat> that might have... <laughs> might have been a mistake. Uh, no, don't beat yourself up about this. It's not worth beating yourself up about. But I'm just saying that, um, you know, it's obviously a natural thing that might have happened. But this is this is logistic information that you need to know. Your husband ne- doesn't necessarily need to know that. If, if, the, if, if the doctor were to say he's clinically depressed, that wouldn't help your husband get into you know, he thinks he's fine. So now he just discounts what that doctor said. So, but it would be good for you to know, to have that information. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's, this is one of those things where it's not like you're going behind his back. You're not going behind his back to hurt him. You're going behind his back to help him. And if the, if, if a, you know, in front of him, the doctor, you know, you're sobbing your eyes out that, that might've been a little embarrassing for him, or it might've been like, you know, putting him in a corner a little, I, I'm not, please forgive me if I'm being harsh in any way. I'm I just, hear. I'm just, I, hear. I, I was just coming from the perspective of he respects what the doctor says. This is the lady who's in charge of his case. If I could, if I can just like, if you can just hear what I'm going through, then she'll 
say her doctorly things and he'll listen. Right. But you're right. I hear I hear what you're saying. Right. That that might work with children or a women. It doesn't work with guys, you know, with men. It, it, you know, it's like okay. tell me what I, if you tell them what they should do, they for sure wouldn't do it. I mean, that's true of a lot of women also. Not me, but you know, okay, fine. But anyway, but the point is that um uh there is a way to handle that. We'll walk you through in that in a minute. But I want to ask, I want to find out what the neurosurgeon said when you asked him, could the medications have the side effect of making him apathetic? We didn't speak about apathy. She only spoke about the lack of food being short-tempered. And what did she say about that? She said definitely one of the meds that he's on has that. Okay, so the side effect of the meds is the short tempered. Did you did she give any alternate suggestions of different meds, bringing him down on this one, up on another, changing his dosage, dosage, changing drugs, changing medications, any of those kind of issues? I didn't have the head to go there. So good. So now you do write this all down, take notes while I'm talking, and go back. And okay. you know, the, even even the neurosurgeon's nurse. I mean, maybe it's better to talk to the neurosurgeon, but you know, will tell you here's you know here's some things you can try. Oh, gee, if he's really short tempered, you know, I would maybe let's go down on this medication. To, oh, why do you switch to this other one? It's proved better even at whatever, and people have much less trouble with it. It accomplishes the same thing physiologically without the mental side effect of of you know, him being short-tempered with you like wow what, what a fix that would be if it was just that uh, the other issue is that people who have had his types of injuries do fantastic with occupational therapy you know, I'm not a professional, so you got to ask people who know this stuff, okay? I'm just giving you, you know, in layman's terms, the kinds of things. Occupational therapists are phenomenal. She can teach him how to, you know, look, if apathy, if, you know, it could be the new normal. It could be that the whole thing that we all cherish in ourselves, which is our joie de vivre, Am I saying it right in French? Who can know? Joie de vivre. Yeah. Whatever. You know, it, 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 you know, which is our, like, what are we going to do next? And what can we, how, how can we make a difference in the world? Wow, God saved my life. I'm going to go out. Now I'm going to got a bucket list. I'm going to go and take a, 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 a disabled child to the to D Disneyland once a week. A different co kid or something. I don't know, making it up. I'm going to go, whatever it is that we're doing. We think that's how it would be. But if you've had this kind of thing and uh, the uh, life altering life, um, threatening thing and you're dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and you don't really know what that is, an occupational therapy therapist will walk you through. If you're, and also it's a lot easier for a husband to say, oh, let's go to occupational therapist. We have, you know, the doctor says, oh yeah, now you're, you're two months out of your last surgery or five months out, you know, she says we need to go to occupational therapy. It's like, oh, okay, what's that exactly? You know, it's kind of like, oh, I'm going to learn to, you know, uh, what, maybe he won't go to that either. But it's a lot easier to take than psychotherapy because I don't have a problem, okay? But if he says no to OT, to going to OT, and I don't know what it isn't called in your country. It might be OT. It might be something else. But basically, Google occupational therapist in your country of what it would be. Um, if he won't go, Debbie, you go. You go and you meet, you, even if you have to pay out of pocket, whatever, it's hopefully not too expensive. Insurance should cover it, but even if it doesn't, it, it, should, be fine, yeah. it should be fine. You sit there for an hour and say, you know, well, he does this and he doesn't, you know, when I tell him then he's short tempered, say, oh, if that happens, a lot of times the, the way these meds work is a half an hour. It does the system and don't ever go talk to him. If he takes the pill at 9 a.m., don't go and talk to him about stressful things till 11 o'clock because it takes an hour and a half for it to work in the, I don't know, I'm making this stuff up, but I'm just saying, mm -hmm. you're not the first person who's gone through this, and the OT will know that, and if you don't, if it's not OTs in your country, country it might be a nurse, or it might be, it might be a, um, uh, you know, the, the, the neurosurgeon or the neurologist will be able to give you some of these answers, but get the answers, and don't have and him. And not a social worker? 
Oh, it could be. It could be a social worker. I don't know if they know. Social workers don't necessarily know medical medication side effects, but it's worth trying. You just leave no stone unturned. You're the boss here. You've got power in this. You're not a victim to this situation. There's a lot you could potentially potentially do. Now, it could be that there's a hundred things you could do and you do a hundred of them and nothing changes. Okay. But at least during that time, the year that it took you to tick off each one of these things that you're going to try, you feel Mm -hmm. like you've got power. You feel, you know, you, you feel like you're not just the victim of the, of the, of circumstances that you, there is something you can do. And maybe you become such an expert on it. There isn't anything. And you look for this and that and the other, there's nothing. And then guess what? You start a blog, how to different things to try. If your husband had brain surgery and is apathetic, here's what you do to reconnect and re get your husband back. And that gives you so much ability to make a difference in the world. We do not know why God gave the, these tests. We don't know. We really don't know. After 120, you will know. Right now, we don't know why. Maybe it's because there is no advocate for people with this, for the wives. Maybe there's no groups for the wives. If there is, for sure join and try and learn from them. Unless they're depressing. It's on on my bucket list of what to do. (laughs) Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, but this is self-care and it's almost like, you know, you owe it to yourself because the, the angst that you deal with every day can be alleviated potentially by your husband's actions changing, but most certainly by your actions changing. Just having a different, you know, like a hope, <laughs> you know, giving yourself hope that there's something there. And also having the answers from your neurosurgeon, you know, is what's the, tra- you know, the progression. So he had these things. Is a year out people start to get their, uh, get their jive back? What do they call it? Get, their gro- get back in their groove. I don't know. I'm not so hip and cool, but I'm just saying. Although I am kind of hip and cool because I'm wearing this outfit. I'm yeah, just- <laughs> okay. way, cool. Actually, huh? Rosemary, Debbie, you don't, you might not be able to see it, but Rosemary actually commented, you look great. Oh! <laughs> You're talking about something deep. Uh, deep like, you better oh, not mention I'm that. that one off the <laughs> Thank you for it. saying that, by and the way. At the end of the show, we will tell you exactly where uh, Leia got her. Oh, I'm not supposed doctor. to tell it now? Well, you can, but. Okay. 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 No, actually, so there's this this website on, uh, or this Instagram thing. You go <laughs> on there, yes. and it's got um, uh, Snea's modest clothing. That are already picked out for you. So you just go there and say, oh, that's modest. That You don't have to like yeah. search through every a million things on Amazon to find modest things. So yeah, we're going to post the... Yeah, I'll give you all the details. Okay, the fine, fine. So anyway, I got this there. It was kind of fun. Okay, fine. You Thank you. So, the there you go. See, it's working. And Debbie, it's just working. for you, um, just so you know, such power for what you're saying. And you're so powerful that you came on. There are people on um, our chat, ladies, that are very much connecting with what you're saying. And someone said, I remember that feeling of walking on eggshells and how Mm -hmm. terrible it was. So you're really giving strength to a lot of people. Thank you, Debbie. Yeah, really, really grateful. Thank you. Thank you. So the logistics things that we're talking about, you know, we've just really, really scratched the surface. It's talking to the doctor, talking to OTs, looking for groups, Googling stuff, making lists for yourself of like, okay, it's bad. Whenever I go in in the afternoon, it tends to be worse. Don't go in to see him in the afternoon or don't, you know, interact with him in the afternoon. It could be that you also do other things behind the scenes. I bet you, you know, he's he's an intelligent guy. I bet you if you hired behind the scenes a tutor, a chavrusa, to stop by the house every day or every other day or twice a week or something like that. Here's how, how you do that. If your husband had somebody he cared about that came and visited him every day and opened a Gemara with him or something, anything, a Musser Safer, anything that you you know your Mm -hmm. husband best, his favorite books, whatever it is, and you invite the person over for Shabbos with this whole thing. You, you first talk to them on the phone or talk to them in person. And you say, hey, listen, you know, my husband's very depressed. I want I want him to have a chavrusa, but if I said it to him, he'd say, no, no, no. He's so depressed he can't even see it. I'm inviting you for Shabbos. <laughs> At the table, I want you to s- start asking him about himself and asking him about and say, hey, have you ever learned Masala Sharam and whatever? And he says, no. I say, you've got to do it. In fact, I'm coming here. I'm coming tomorrow. I'm going to meet with you, whatever. And you secretly pay this person. And you secret- and he is secretly befriends your husband. There would be a whole new lease on life that your husband would have. 
now is people mm-hmm. say, oh, that's sneaky and that spy. What are you, a spy and whatever? You're trying to take care of him. And he doesn't have the frame of mind to know that he's depressed and he needs taken care of. And he would resent anything that you did to make him feel like he something's wrong. Something's wrong with him. Something, you know. So uh, there, anyway, these are the kinds of things, the kind of logistics that you can take care of. You, you, you have sort of a game plan of where to start with this. Get yourself a notebook and start taking notes on it and, and making plans. You got the picture on the logistics? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think what's so powerful about what you're saying to her is that you're basically, and it's for everyone, not anyone, not just necessarily someone whose husband went through a tr- you know traumatic experience like a brain surgery or et cetera or right. a mental illness, whatever it is. It's for all of us that the whim- the minute we put the power back in our court yeah. and we're not dependent mm-hmm. yeah. on yeah. the situation being what it is, we say, well, we have the power to change and do something, even that little Point one percent. Yeah, right. That automatically is going to make the whole. You feel strong. Rela- yeah, yeah, it strengthens yeah. us and makes the whole relationship better in the long run. So good. Very it's, it's fantastic. Thank you. And and so Debbie, I want to get into emotional, but I want to just make sure I got your questions answered about kinds of things to do for logistics. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, great. Okay, fine. Fine. Now let's get back to date night. Okay, because okay, yeah. When you, every woman wants to look up to her husband, wants to feel like he's the king and whatever, and when you're looking at your husband and seeing him somewhat of a shadow of his former self, it's very, very painful. And you use the word, when we're talking on the phone, you use the word resentment. You resent that he's not there. Even even if, let's say, there was nothing that, to be done about it, and this is how it is, there would be a resentment. But But here you feel like he... He's volitionally choosing to not live life to the fullest. Yeah? Yeah. Or that he it's the it's too it's too painful for him to choose to not be a living zombie. Say that again? It's too painful for him to not be a living painful. zombie. It's too painful. Like he's Hashem has saved his life so many times, but again, like he's been sick so many times mm. that it might be scary for him to hope or go out and live or start again because who knows, like this type of thing could come back, God forbid, but it has come back more than once and more than twice and more than three times. So I can understand but in the time that you have, that's where I feel like, I mean, it's just a mental shift. You could be afraid, but you, I think that these books about what people who are chronically ill and that they're so strong and everything, they don't help people like me. <laughs> I don't know. Why? What do you mean? I don't know how to look. Why don't they help you people like to- you? I didn't follow that logic there. You have people who write books where they can only... Uh, type using blinking with their eyelids. And they manage to crank out books and be so strong and be so positive. They're living and using their whatever abilities they have to the, to the maximum. Right. And so I'm at, when, whenever I'm exposed to that sort of thing, I'm like, well, can he do that too? What? Right, meaning okay. basically what you're saying, Debbie, is that reading those books actually makes you feel worse because you're almost saying, well, if these people are doing it, you know, they literally are typing with their eyes and producing books and they're having amazing relationships with the people around them. Why can't my husband, who's being given a second and a third and a fourth lease on life, Mm -hmm. do the same? Why can't, and I'm not asking him to write books. I'm asking him just to be a functioning husband and father. So yeah. it's depressing to her to read them because her oh, husband's never going to be there. I'm not reading them. Even just hearing right. about the stories right. or coming right. across people right. who know right. of these stories. Right. And I'm not, right. not perfect. Maybe let him read them. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a present. Yeah, Give him all those books. Yeah, and right. Read these books. So I hear the issue is, though, that the reason they they have books and the books sell is because it's so rare. Mm-hmm. 
That's not really what's, what the day-to-day -day life of people is. I mean, I, I've got, you know, students who have husbands with mental, disabil mental health disabilities and, you know, they're, they're not able to work and they're not able to provide for the family and not even be exactly much of a husband in a lot of sense and short-tempered and, you know, people are dealing with stuff. The question is, emotionally, what is the, we get the challenge, okay? Emotionally, what is a way that you can shift, what are some tools that you can use emotionally to be able to go through day-to-day -day life? That's the question. Mm -hmm. So let's look, at, let's look at some of this. There's a um, very, very um, powerful thing about, it's cliche about cleaving to Hashem, that there's times when we go through difficulty and we cleave to God. And, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there, there's that, that, I don't know if you know the story, I'll tell it anyway for the, for the benefit of people who haven't heard it, you might have heard it, but, you know, where, where a person gets after 120 and he's up with God and he's talking to God and they're showing a video of his whole life or whatever, and they look, watch the video and... You know, the, suddenly the guy is, you know, had a had a, um, a terrible disagreement with his wife, and it, it was very serious and whatever. And and wait, I'm sorry. They see the footprints uh, on the beach, and God is walking next to him. You know, the whole his whole life. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, when he has this horrible situation with his wife, this crisis with his wife, there's only one set of footprints. And then again, there's two mm -hmm. sets. A little bit, a few years later, two two sets. And uh, then he had a child, had, had a child that's sick. And again, only one set of footprints walking along the beach. And the man's looking at this and he said, then the third time his, his kid, his, one of his kids, uh, uh, what's another tragedy? I don't know. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> Whatever. His, his other kid uh, uh, drops out of school and, and it becomes, um, uh, does nothing or whatever. And it was the, one of the hardest things he and his wife ever dealt with in their life. And again, he sees one piece, one pair of footprints on the sand and he turned to God and he said, look at this, God, you walk through my whole life with me. But in my most difficult hours, you disappeared. And God says, no, 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 my son. Those were those times. There was one set of prints because I was carrying you. And it's very, yeah. very, yeah, powerful. It's very, very easy at the time to be so caught up in the minute details of our emotional you know, like walking on eggshells ain't fun, you know, wondering what's going to be ha with the future ain't fun. Having a lack of hope for the future is no fun <sighs> understatement. Um, so it's very easy to be caught up in a um, whirlwind of day-to-day -day emotions rather than seeing the big picture. And I know when I spoke with you, you get the big picture. You're like, you just should be grateful he's alive, you know. But it's right. easy to go right into the quagmire of having a certain expectation of who he should be, how he should be going through this, how he should be dealing with it, based on, yes, 19-year track record of being married to him and, you know, seeing who he should be in this situation and who he could be, even worse, who he could be in this situation. And exactly. that expectation that you have of him, those pictures that you have in your head and who you think you would be, that's what is the source of most of your angst without realizing that God is the one who brought you here for reasons we don't know. You know, it's interesting. We all have probably thought about, you know, gosh, who would I be in the Holocaust? You know, God forbid, if I was in some concentration camp, who would I be? What would I be like? Mm -hmm. And I always, you know, from this is a very personal thing, but, you know, is that I'm going to be the one who's going to be saying, don't worry, tomorrow's going to be better, and the mm -hmm. Allies are coming to free us any day now. You know, I'd be the pump or go or go getter or whatever. And then I use these little tooth swords, you know, so if something between my, you know, when I don't, when I'm out to a restaurant and I forgot to bring a teeth sword and something's mm -hmm. between my teeth, 
I don't last like 10 minutes. Was that right. just like... <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You're like, if I can't last without a tooth sword, how am I lasting without food <laughs> and, and shelter and clothing? I'm just yeah. crumbled yeah. to yeah. my knees yeah. of who those people yeah. were, who yeah. they must have been to survive yeah. Yeah. and to be whole. Yeah. Just frightening. It's frightening. Mm-hmm. So I... I know we all have pictures of who we think we would be and who we think our husband should be in these situations. Dismantling that, I'm telling you, is the greatest gift you could do for yourself. And I'll tell you exactly how to do it, but you just have to understand the value in it because you can, we can eat ourselves apart, uh, eat, eat ourselves apart, eat ourselves up, you know, or tear ourselves apart. I was mixing two metaphors. Um, by how we think it should be and how our husband should be and whether our husband's ill or whether our husband's perfectly healthy, we have these images and pictures in our head of what our expectations were when we got married, what what maybe he's even told us. I want to be this and I want to do that. And, and you're like, oh, and you bought into his dream, but he couldn't fill, fulfill his dream. More importantly, God didn't fulfill what his dream was. And so you're living a life, you know, he, you thought, oh, is she still there? Are you still there? Oh, shame. Let me try again. Yeah, we're going to call her back. I don't know what she heard. Yeah. No, I think Hello? she just Oh, fantastic. Okay. Oh, just... I'm so glad I forgot my phone shut off after an hour. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, good. Okay. okay so what part did you... What, what, that's okay. What did you... That was lucky that it worked right away. That's from our sound engineer. Yes. Thumbs up. Call out to sound <laughs> engineer. Thank you. Okay, fine. Um, so I was... Now, just draw, start from... You said the images that we have. Yeah, the images we, we have, whether your husband's ill or not ill, you know, you're, we have these images of who we wish they were, who they said they were going to be, or who we thought we were going to be, or who we married, and then they changed, you know, and these pictures that we carry around with our, us, besides causing us great angst, we have to understand one thing. Our husband also had pictures, whatever, how much have we lived up to what we, our own potential and our own pictures, you know, that should give us pause to be so judgmental and so demanding of who we wish they were. There is a, it's kind of like, um, God will test you on something. So he'll, 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 he'll burn the dinner one night. The burn, you, you'll burn the dinner one night. Mm-hmm. He'll, you'll keep burning the dinner night after night. And like, cause you're not passing the test of like being able to like, oh, instead of trying to eat, cook dinner when the kids get home, I'm going to cook dinner and leave it on warm, you know, uh, or reheat it afterwards because cooking the dinner and having the kids, I need to be spending time with the kids. I need to be focused on them and looking at them and listening to them. I'm making this silly example, but I'm just saying that, you know, the the lessons we have in life, once we learn them, then we don't necessarily need to burn the dinner or have the dinner burned or whatever. So here, there, the lesson here is there's certain judgments and expectations you have about your husband that until you get it and own it and realize it, there's going to be this friction. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what kind of communications you had with your husband before all of this and what kind of communication you have now. Because one thing you did Wait, say... Can I ask a question in between? Yes. About what you just said. Mm-hmm. I know that letting go of the expectation that he, just in a small... You know, get up on time or... But a long time ago, I let go of, like, that he can help me because he can't help me anymore. I, I, I know that. And that I did experience the relief, like, okay, like, just accept it. He's not going to have a job. He's going to sleep a lot, all these things. But if I accept the, what, what you're talking about, like, these, like, what he could be, which is the painful part, then that's very sad as, in as much as it creates tension to look at him with these unmet expectations or hopes. But then if I let go of the hope, then I'm letting go of the hope. Okay, I hear that. The very brilliant question, Debbie. Let me ask you this. Do you, before you had your first child, 
were you an accomplished woman already in your own right? You know, were you able to get stuff done and be very efficient? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you were, you were I mean, obviously, you were single at some point and running a life and whatever. So most people, yeah. the, you know, they, they, they have some level of competence in running their life. So at some point you have a baby and like your total days are about diapers and uh, when was the last feeding and when do you remember that transition yeah and it's like hello like this is what my time is this is like i am so good with my time i'm like efficient i, I like you know when you were in school you were you got a's because you studied and you set 15 minutes of this and you had timers so that you did this in time and whatever and now all of a sudden your husband comes home and you're like what did you do all day it's like I shaved my left leg. You know, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, right, right, right. Only I mean, one leg. Uh, one, one leg. leg. We got one leg. One Come leg. On, you know, like, hello. You know, that's a big accomplishment. I mean, this is a time when you just don't, you, you can't even go to the bathroom without, you know, so managing how you're going to do that. Um, so that transition, and it's like, and then you get into cooking a little because that's, food is a very important when you're nursing and whatever. So, I, I'm just showing you a little bit of a slight picture. Like, would anybody consider that time wasted? The time that you were up till three in the morning and then you woke up at four mm. and then, you know, whatever. You were just keeping everybody alive and making sure nothing bad happened and just feeding everybody, feeding yourself, feeding your husband, feeding your newborn baby. And that time that you invested you know, on the grand scale, if you're looking at the, you know, um, uh, you know, corporate America, well, yeah, she just, you know, she, she just wasted her time. Mm -hmm. But nobody on the planet. That's a very good mindset. Mm. Yeah. It's a spiritual, on a spiritual level, perhaps that time where you didn't care about time and what, what you really accomplished that day, that's just being present in the moment on a spiritual level you were doing God's work. You were doing p possibly, oh. yeah, seriously, you were doing like the, <laughs> you were doing the most important thing with your life, with no deadlines, with no productivity, with nothing to show for it, except for a live baby. Yeah, <laughs> but thank you. But, yeah, so sorry. but I'm just saying there, there, there was a, you know, there was just a lot. And at some point, you know, when you got two or three kids, which you got four, you know, you're just like, it is what it is. Like, you know, it's the kids are home from summer camp, you know, and they're, they're home I'm, today. It's like, I, I was supposed to go to this or that because school was canceled. It's a snow day or whatever. I don't know if you have snow days where you live, you know, whatever Th that's out the window. And now you are just totally being present with the moment and the chesed that you do for your children. And that's an eternal merit for you. Nothing you ever could do in your life could ever take that away. All the beautiful mitzvahs you did and all of the merit you accrued in that time. And that's that is a beautiful perspective. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. It's exactly where you yeah, are right yeah. now. But I think also, I don't know that necessarily, maybe Debbie didn't fully um, understand, because what I took from what you were saying before was not that you're telling her to give up on her hope or to stop hoping that her life will one day be better and that her husband will get back on his feet and that things will change. I think you were just telling her to drop for now the expectations of what she is expecting of her husband and it shouldn't be well he should be up and he should be getting dressed and he should be going yeah. out like yeah. dropping that yeah. and just being appreciative of every little thing that he's doing at the moment right now but not losing uh, that hope of what the future is because she's saying that hope is what keeps her going and she should right. never stop hoping right Think, right? That was, uh, yes, you, 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 you clarified that exactly, but with a caveat, which is until there is a deep shift in your appreciation for just being mm -hmm. present with him and being in the moment with him, then the that you've got this dark cloud mm -hmm. hanging over your head because the present seems so not bleak. fulfilling and bleak, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah, but once the, the yeah. pre present becomes so, such a gift and so, like, you just sitting there in the room with him is huge mitzvah. It's a huge, like, th 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 that, that 
treasuring that moment with him, just being there for him, being in the room with him. Even sometimes you're bored. You know, it's very interesting. People, uh, I have a lot of people who've come from dysfunctional things. Everybody, you know, whatever. But, the, you know, they come from, and they say, Leia, you know, I like this guy. I'm talking about single people now just for to sh show Marshall. I like this guy, but I just feel bored around him. <laughs> Boredom is a good thing, okay? It is a good thing. You're addicted to drama. You're addicted to, you know, angst. And what's going to be? What's going to be? Boredom is a serenity. People confuse the two. So, <laughs> so, so, so sitting in the room with him and doing nothing. You know what? Go out and get some get Chinese checkers. Get... A, jigsaw puzzles get uh you know try everything get uh, the, these adult coloring books you know that where that whatever i got the you know i have somebody who's in a nursing home and i sent her six adult coloring books of you know ones of, of nature whatever ones of unicorns they she mm -hmm. likes unicorns you know plus a whole set a kit that was like it was 11 dollars, and it had every pen and different colors and pencils and all kinds of different things or whatever do you know, I, when I visit that person, they're still, like, they're not even a tenth of the way. And they, they, it's out. It's out on their little thing they have that, you know. That, so find stuff that is just in the moment to do with him. It, better yet, find stuff you like to do. You like puzzles and he doesn't. Okay, so you sit there and do a jigsaw puzzle. Get yourself a little table and a whatever. Think of your whole life with him as a gift to be in the moment. Because do you know how many wives come to me and say, Leah, I love my husband. All I want to do is be with him. And he's off here. He's on this committee. He's running. He's on that. He's got his business full time or whatever. Whatever reason, God gave you this very unusual gift. I hear it's got its not silver lining. What's the opposite of silver lining? Yeah. You know, it's challenging part that, you know, you wished he was productive. I, I get that. But You've got somehow God gave you this gift and take it as this is my, you know, way of meditation. Oh, it's my way of going into myself of, of spiritually just reaping the rewards. I parked 19 years into this guy, you know, and here's our closeness. This is it. This is our closeness. Is that something okay. you, you can you can try? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so okay, we have we're kind of having to wrap up. I wanted to just touch on the communication because in a situation like this, usually you know, it says, "Oh, you can't keep don't keep secret secrets from your husbands and whatever." I totally disagree. Don't talk about any past boyfriends you ever had. <laughs> ever. Boyfriends, what? What, what, what? Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Any guy that you had a crush on. If there's a movie star or a, a La Havdil, does anyone know what a movie star is? Yeah. These famous people. What? If there's somebody who you like the looks of, it's not for your husband to know. And in the same token here, it just is painful. Like, would you want to know, oh, he, he thinks this uh, celebrity is uh, uh, beautiful? No. It, it, then every time you see a picture of her, every, you're in the grocery store, you see whatever, you know, it just, it's painful. What, what's the point exactly? So for this, see, keeping secrets is very important. But for this, keeping some agenda of how you're going to get closer to him, you don't need to have this whole big dialogue i'm going to get closer to you and i'm going to you know no do the <laughs> do the, everything behind the scenes find an ot find a harusa for him find you know get puzz, bring puzzles home and say you know i the, the, you can even tell him you know i have been so stressed lately i have planned next tuesday at 12 o'clock where i'm we're going to lunch and after that we're coming back and doing a jigsaw puzzle and they'll be like, what? And say, you know, you, I need downtime. I've had I've, this and that happened. And you can list all the things you've been doing and all. And this with this move, you're perfect. Say, with this move, I just need a, to, a block of time just to down, to, what's that called when you unwind? Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> I was like, I knew what I meant. And, you know, well, just to unwind. And I want to do it with you. Something like that. Or don't even tell him that. Just walk in with a jigsaw puzzle. Or a, I happen to like jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> you yeah, you keep, keep using that example. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff. Or get him a new camera. How's that? You know, one of these, you know, uh, things that, that uh, point and shoot or something. Something, use your creativity to as if you were um, trying to bring somebody out of post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, and maybe Google it and see what, how do you bring someone out of post-traumatic, what are some of the tips and techniques?
Oh, get a puppy. Oh, get a, you know, I don't know if you have to ask your local Orthodox rab, you know, whatever, you, you know, what, if get a, a hamster, something, what helps these people to get their life back and get their enjoyment in life back? So you, that coupled with this whole shift in you of just being with him in the moment. Okay. So Debbie, I want to thank you so, so much for being with us here today. We want to follow up. We'd love to hear either on an email or come on the show sometime You, go, you go on the teleconference, come back on. We'd love to hear how things went, what you were able to accomplish. And for everybody, those of you watching, here's the homework for the week. Do something one time a week to just enjoy the presence of your husband to just be in the moment with your husband. Thank you. This is Leah Richheimer for the Ladies Talk Show.